Well, good morning. Good morning. Faithful few this morning, yeah? <laughs> we are so glad to be together with you for worship this morning here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are, it's a, it's a beautiful day to worship our God and to come before him. So just ask that you would stand as you are able as we worship uh, together this morning.
brothers and sisters, hear this good word from Psalm 107 this morning. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those that he has redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those he has gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in the desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Some went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wits' end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. So he stilled the storm to a soft whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind.
Father, your word reminds us that every day we are faced with an incredible opportunity, the opportunity to lead your lost souls home to you. Your word proclaims this truth. The harvest is ripe and it is plentiful, but so often the workers are few. Help us, O oh Lord, to serve you every day with a desire to share the love of Jesus, the truth of the gospel, and the powerful restoration of your mercy and grace for us. Step by step, may we be your mouthpiece and instruments sounding the call of Jesus Christ, our Savior. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning once again. Welcome to worship here this morning. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. Um, I want to share just a few uh, words of announcement uh, with everybody uh, this morning. First and foremost, um, I want to remind you all that uh, beginning Wednesday of this week, uh, I and my family will be on vacation and uh, we will be um, away from this place until ju uh, June 30th. So um, in the meantime, if you should have any pastoral needs of any kind, if you need prayer for something, if you uh, would like to speak to someone about a pastoral need, um, you can certainly feel free to contact Joyce Daniels or Lane Camps, who are both here this morning someplace. I know Lane's here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you can certainly reach out to them uh, in my absence. Uh, if you need anything else, uh, Jeannie uh, Brown is back from her week-long vacation, and so she'll be in the office um, here's the thing, just a reminder, um, I'm probably not going to answer the phone if you call me. So uh, I'm, I'm only going to answer for Joyce, Lane, or Jeannie, so, or maybe my mom, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, but um, please, if you need anything, don't hesitate to reach out to them. Um, they're, they're always here, and as is all of our staff, uh, certainly to, to, to make ma are made available to you guys. Um, we have uh, another great uh, outdoor service that is going to be coming up uh, Jul Sunday, July 4th. Um, it's interesting because July 4th falls on a Sunday, so we may as well celebrate together. We're going to have an outdoor service that morning, 10 a.m. on the uh, west side of the church. And following that service, we will have a family picnic with hamburgers, hot dogs, that kind of thing. And then um, after the family picnic... Now, I know that this probably isn't great for a lot of you who are sitting here this morning, but maybe out there on Facebook world this morning, uh, we're going to have our kids versus adults uh, wiffle ball tournament. So uh, it is a great, uh, wonderful day. I think that means Bob Letts is super excited to participate. So, um, But we're, we're hopeful that uh, we'll see a lot of our kids uh, that particular day, and we, we are looking very forward to this fun tradition. Uh, if you know, the kids don't show up, then you guys are going to have to play wiffle ball with me. So, you know, that's the way it's going to work. <coughs> um, I think that's the announcements we have for today. Is there anything I'm missing, Jeannie, do you think? Okay. Great. Yes. On that particular day, yeah, we're going to be outside. J on July 4th, 10 o'clock church service. Oh, while I'm gone, yes, yeah, sorry, yes, we will still have church, absolutely. Just because I'm not here doesn't mean we stop. Uh, I have very, very talented staff who support me, and so they're going to make sure that that all happens. 
Uh, next week, you're going to hear a little bit from Jill. And then the following week, uh, William Camps is our guest speaker. So that's going to be uh, super awesome. Um, all right. With that, um, let's have a word of prayer this morning. Um, one thing that I would encourage you to be praying about, uh, we've kind of joked about the fact that it's a little light in here this morning. I know that it's summer, but would you join us um, in praying just that the Lord would open the doors of this place and folks would return home um, uh, for worship here. We're very excited for that to begin happening. The state of Illinois is open as of Friday. Praise the Lord, right? Uh, but uh, we're hopeful that the, the folks will just start coming home for worship um, and joining us here in the building. So we, we'd encourage you to be praying that way with us as well. Let's pray together. Well, Father, well, what a good and awesome thing it is that you love us so much that uh, with every single step we take, you are with us. You never leave our side. In fact, Father, in moments where we begin to stumble and fall, you run to the front of us or run behind us to catch us. Every move we make, Lord, you are with us. David prayed so many times about your right hand and how it upholds us. Your strength, your power, your wisdom, your goodness, your faithfulness your provision for us. All of these things given to us, Father, by your right hand. So, Lord, this morning, the first thing we do is give thanks. It may have felt weird this morning. We sang a Thanksgiving song. But every day, we should be reminded of how thankful we are for everything that you give to us, that you do for us, how you love us. And every day, Father, we should be reminded that there is a harvest. There are seeds that have been planted that need to be nourished and watered. And there are fruit that is ripe and ready to come home. But Father, what good is ripe fruit? What good are seedlings if there's no one to tend to them, if there's no one to reap them home for you? And so, Father, this morning... Jesus reminds us that there is a plentiful harvest, but so often the workers are few. Father, may we be your faithful workers. May we be ready to go and share the name of Jesus. May we be eager to bring the harvest home. Father, this morning there are many who are on our hearts and our minds, those who are sick, those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Father, there are some who have great financial concern this morning. There are many relationships that desperately need your intervention, Father. For all of these things, Lord, we pray that you would come and hear the prayers of your people, that you would answer us, that you would care for these loved ones. Father, to the sick, would you be the great physician? To those who are grieving, would you be all comfort and peace? For those who are in financial need or whose relationships are broken, would you be all that they could ever possibly need? Father, it is so good to be in your house this morning. It is so good to be able to sit here and worship together, to, to see one another, to sing together and hear one another's voices. And Father, as our state has opened up a bit more, we pray for continued protection for all of us. That you would keep us safe, not just from COVID-19, but from all of the illnesses and the sicknesses of this world, the dangers of this world that seek to do us in. And Father, we pray that you would continue to keep the doors of your house open, that we can be with one another, worship together, fellowship together. And Father, we desperately pray that you would bring the family home. That you would gather us from the many scattered places we find ourselves. That we would come home to worship you. And so Father, now as we turn our hearts and our minds to your word this morning, would you then by the power of your Holy Spirit give us discernment, 
Would you help us to have ears which are opened to hear and hearts which are opened to receive the word you have for us this morning? We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. continuance of our prayer. Lord, prepare us to be your sanctuary. Well, brothers and sisters, as we come to sit under God's word this morning, I would ask that wherever you are, you would stand as we give God's word its fullest authority in our hearts and in our minds this morning. This morning, we read from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 9, beginning at verse 35. We ask that the Lord would add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. Matthew records, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word to us. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, this morning we take a look at just one last word picture that Jesus draws for us. This morning we hear the Savior draw this particular picture, and he actually draws two pictures for us this morning in just four short verses. The first picture that he draws for us in verse 35 is of a flock of sheep, poor, helpless. This flock of sheep has no other hope in all of this world than to be harassed and to be mocked by other people. They're ridiculed for their waywardness. We might ask, what causes the sheep to be so wayward and helpless. And Jesus' answer is pretty straightforward and clear. They lack a shepherd. 
Uh, the second picture that Jesus draws for us this morning is a field full, ripe with produce to be harvested. The plants have born in this instance a bumper crop. You remember the maple trees earlier this spring with the bumper crop of seeds? The fruit here is hanging low. They're ready to be collected. But there's a problem that remains in this picture. Because there's such a plentiful harvest, but there's barely anyone to go and reap it in. Now, this morning, to illustrate Jesus' point, I thought maybe we could have a quick little object lesson this morning. Everybody likes an object lesson, right? So, Sarah, you come on up and grab the items we need. And I'm, I'm going to do a life-size visual illustration this morning of gathering in the harvest. I'm going to need a couple of volunteers this morning. So, Ethan and Kevin have graciously agreed to come and, and help us this morning. Now, as, as Sarah brings these two bowls out, I will tell you they are filled with chocolate pudding. And when I tell you they're filled with chocolate pudding, Lane Camps is thrilled that I didn't ask him to participate this time because last time I poured it over his head. But we're not doing that. But th we're not doing that, right? So this morning what we're doing, right, is we have these two big bowls of chocolate pudding. And uh, into those bowls of chocolate pudding, we are going to put gummy bears and gummy worms. Okay? Everybody with us still? Okay. You're going to put that on and put the hole over your head. You're going to wear it like a dress. Okay. That's the part that Lane Camps remembers. Yeah. Okay. Now everybody gets a little bit of gummy bears and a little bit of uh, gummy worms. And we're going to mix those gummy bears and those gummy worms right into this bowl of chocolate pudding. If you're looking for a dessert to take to a cookout this summer, I don't recommend this one. Okay. All right. So now we have two bowls of chocolate pudding and gummy bears that have been well prepared. The harvest is now plentiful, right? Because we have a lot of gummy bears and worms in here. Now what Jesus says is there's a plentiful harvest, right? But the workers are few. So thankfully we have two workers, all right? And their job is going to be to take those little gummy bears and worms and harvest them and put them into these cups, right? The trick is, open wide, they have to use a spoon in between their teeth, gather them out, and fill them into this cup. So this is our Cornerstone Faith Community Church version of Minute to Win It. All right? So... You might want it just a little further in, but okay. All right, so whenever you guys ready, okay. Cannot use your hands. That's why they're inside the garbage bag. All right, 60 seconds on the clock. Ready, set, go. Oh, awesome. Good job, Ethan. Oh, Kevin. Kevin's got one. One and one. All right. Is somebody keeping time? Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Yes. Well done. Good. <laughs> I wish you guys could see this up close. It's awesome. <laughs> All right. Oh, so cool. Well, Ethan, my goodness, look at you. Wow. All right. Okay. Oh! <laughs> my dad didn't see that. Okay. We're good. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. All right. All right. There you go. Yeah, well done. All right. Five, four, three, oh, two, one. Time's up. All right. Well done. Well done. Okay. Good job. Now you guys can take your things off of it. Well done. Yeah, give them a hand. Okay. So let's just, uh, let's just do a little calculation here. Kevin, I think you're, uh, I think you lost, bud. Uh, so there's two... Four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten.
and 12. 13, 14, 14. Thank you guys for being such good sports. And I'm just saying, for all you kids that are, you know, out there and not here this morning, you miss chocolate pudding and gummy worms, you know? It's a great thing. All right, so here's the good news for you all today, all right? You don't have to eat chocolate pudding and gummy worms, unless you want to, I suppose, but there are three very simple points that Jesus brings up and illustrates for us this morning. Jesus couldn't be, I don't think, any more clear this morning as he discusses for us the harvest and the workers. Each of his points are very straightforward, incredibly easy to understand. Unfortunately, though, his points Though they're easy to understand, that doesn't necessarily mean they're easy to do, to follow. The call that Jesus places for all of those who would follow him today is not an easy one, but it is a fruitful one. Fruitful not for you or for me, but fruitful for the kingdom of God, for Jesus. Here is what he says. If the church triumphant is God's storehouse, then the call that Jesus makes today is this. Get ready to fill up the storehouses to the brim because there is a bumper crop of people out there in the world who are desperately, desperately in need, desperately desiring God. So Jesus' first point that we can follow this morning is this. He says, do this. That's pretty simple, right? Do this. I mean, it's clear. But the question then becomes, do what? I'm going to attempt at least to spare you of the boredom of the technical jargon that comes and surrounds This verse, the commentary writers, the biblical theologians, they use a lot of technical language. Suffice it to say this, Jesus employs or uses a Greek language tool here. It is a particular way of speaking which includes a practical application and something called a hyperbolic illustration, meaning it's an illustration that's designed to Make a picture come to your head. There's a Latin phrase that has been used down through history to talk about what Jesus is doing here. It goes like this. It says, quod erat demonstratum. Aren't you glad you know that now? It literally just means this. This has been written so that you may believe. What has been written is written so that you might believe. Jesus speaks in this particular way, and he uses such particular examples this morning in this passage, and he has one particular purpose in doing so, so that many, you and I included, may believe. It's been written so that we'll believe. What kind of practical application does Jesus give us this morning? If we looked at verse 35, once again, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages. He was teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. That's the practical part. Jesus calling to you and I, and he says, if you want to know how to bring people to the Lord, here's what you're going to need to do. But what sort of illustrations does Jesus give us this morning? If we look at verses 36 and 37, it says, When he saw those crowds, 
he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. That's the word picture. Sheep without a shepherd. Everybody gone astray. Heartbroken. So as Jesus calls to you and I this morning, he calls us into what I'm going to call harvest reaping service. And he's got a great gift to offer us. As we go about the work that Jesus has described for us, remember Matthew 28? As we endeavor to go out into all the world, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them the commands of Jesus Christ, we're going to find that, you know what, some extra help when we do that would be very, very useful. So that's what Jesus provides to us today. He says, do this. And then he gives us what I'm going to call a step-by-step harvest manual. You know, you buy a new car and you got to, Bruce taught me, you got to go into the glove box, pull the book out and read the whole thing so you know what the car does, right? This is your harvest manual. Step one, go. You've actually got to go. I- I'm sure that you all have sat through message after message with this very same point. I'm making you listen to it one more time. Could Jesus be any more clear this morning? Could he be any more specific? Could he make his intentions any easier for us to understand? I really rather doubt it. What is more simply understood than Jesus saying, go, do it? Think about it. When a child misbehaves, has failed to listen to us, or failed to comply with some kind of regulation or rule that we have, as their parents, set for them, we give them the same kind of command, don't we? Go, now, do it. Of course, in this case, the command when we're parents, right, is go, make haste, get your bedroom cleaned up or whatever it is. Jesus isn't banishing us to our bedrooms as a punishment. In fact, here he's commanding us to go away from him, go out from his presence, but it's not a punishment. The go in this sense is to send us out in his name with his presence and his blessing so that he, we can bring other people back to him. In the very next chapter, after the passage we read this morning, in chapter 10 of Matthew, Jesus gives a very similar command to his disciples. He says, the 12 sent out with the follow, were sent out with the following instructions. He says, do not go among Gentiles or enter the town of the Samaritans. Rather... Go to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near to you. So heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received from me. Now freely go and give. I mean, hey, at least Jesus isn't calling us to go and heal the sick, raise the dead, treat the lepers, drive out the demons, right? The call in Matthew 9, the call in Matthew 10 are both the same. And they start with the same word, go. And the second thing in Jesus' manual, step two, teach. Teach. The word disciple is defined this way in English dictionaries. One who accepts and assists in the spreading of doctrines of another. In particular, it says, a personal follower of Jesus. If we are going to go and we are going to make disciples, then we necessarily are called to go and be teachers. So Jesus demonstrated this very truth in our text today. Verse 35 reminds us that Jesus went through all of those towns and he went into their synagogues and he taught them. His purpose was specific. He went with the intention to teach Now, what about you and I? What is our intention when we go out from this place, wherever it is that we go? I mean, perhaps the better way for me to ask that question is this. Since Jesus is clearly calling you and I to teach others about him, what's your plan for doing that? There's no question. I'm not asking if you would be willing to go out and teach. You know, sometimes the 
people at the church come to you and say, hey, would, would you be willing to teach Sunday school? And you go, ha, ha, no, not me. I'm not asking if you would teach. I'm saying, since Jesus called you to go out and teach others about him, what's your plan? How are you going to do that? As a follower of Jesus, you have to be willing to teach. There's a problem, though. Some of you are going to stand up this morning and say, I'm not a good teacher. What if I don't know how to teach? What if I'm not good at getting up in the front of a, a group of people? And, and, and what if I'm not good even just sitting across the table from one other purpose and teaching them? Like, what if I don't know how to teach? Does that mean that I'm a failure for Jesus? And the answer is no. Or at least you don't have to be. Okay? You don't have to be. Jesus concludes verse 35 with three life kind of application ways of teaching. He says, preach good news. That's step three in his manual. Preach good news. If you want to go out and teach somebody about Jesus, preach good news. Now, this doesn't mean, by the way, that you have to get up here on Sunday morning and give a sermon. There are so many other ways to preach the good news of Jesus. One of the most simple ways I know to preach the good news of Jesus is with a word that our society loves to talk about. Love. Going out and loving somebody like Jesus loves, that's a great way to teach them. I mean, can you, I'm asking you now, can you love someone? And if you can, you can teach them about Jesus. You can preach good news to them. Here's another simple way to preach good news. Can you care for someone? Doing something to help someone in need who is less fortunate than you. Going out of your way to make someone else know that they are important. That they have worth. That they are loved. That's preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Or what about simply responding to people the way Jesus would respond to them? Perhaps you'll recall these words from Matthew 5 when Jesus says, Blessed are you when people insult you or persecute you or falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you. What shall we do when insult and persecution and falsehood and evil come our way? Jesus says, rejoice exceedingly. This doesn't mean that when somebody insults you, you go, hey, you guys want to come over? I'm going to throw a, hey, I just got insulted party. What it means is that we rejoice when people insult us or persecute us or trials come our way because even in the midst of that moment, one thing hasn't changed and we still have a reason to rejoice. Jesus has still conquered the grave for you and me. So when we rejoice, no matter what comes our way, then people tend to ask us questions, don't they? They go, hey, how come you're always so happy? How come you always seem so kind to people? How come nothing ever seems to bother you? By the way, there's your teaching opportunity. There's your preaching opportunity. For you to say to them, Jesus. One word answer, Jesus. And if that doesn't start a conversation, I think you're lying. So the question is, will you teach somebody about Jesus? The, the fourth Thing that Jesus puts in his manual. He says, bring healing. Bring healing. The fifth thing in his manual, he says, have compassion. Go teach. Preach good news. Bring healing. Have compassion. Listen, we aren't all doctors, are we? In fact, we're not even all pharmacists. But then maybe Jesus isn't only speaking here about medical healing, about physical healing. Maybe what Jesus is getting at here is that we are to bring emotional healing or mental healing or financial healing or relationship healing or marriage healing or friendship healing. I mean, sure, maybe there are moments where we are called to pray for or bring some kind of physical healing for someone. 
And when it comes to compassion, which one of us hasn't been desperately in need of compassion at one point or another in our lives? We know what it feels like to need compassion. So go teach, preach good news, bring healing, have compassion. That's what Jesus means when he says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. What he fervently desires is more willing shepherds. And here's why. What this world needs now more than ever is more shepherds willing to serve. I'm sorry, Burt Bacharach was wrong maybe, right? What the world needs now, yeah, love, more love. But the world needs some willing shepherds to bring the love of Jesus. Have you ever heard the phrase, there are too many chiefs and not enough Indians? You've heard that before. It's a true statement. We are rarely at a loss for people who want to be in control of things. But so often we are at a loss for people who are willing to get in there, dig in, get their hands dirty. Everybody wants to be the supervisor in charge. Very few people want to work on the line. Why is that? What happened to our world, our society? I mean, don't we say that America was founded and built up by folks who did whatever it took, whatever was necessary to start this new life in America, build up the American dream? Where did all of our workers go? Clearly this problem is nothing new, though, because Jesus suggests the very same problem. He says, we've got a ripe harvest, and there isn't a single person to go out there and bring it in. A couple weeks ago, we planted our garden at our house. Now, Ethan loves sweet corn. And for a number of years, we, he had quite a sensitivity to it. He seems to have outgrown that. So this year... He's super excited because we planted our own sweet corn. The other day we were driving and I mentioned that we have little baby corn. He thought that I meant we had little baby corn ears on the plants. What I meant was we have little baby plants this big. So his question was, how soon till we have corn? August he can't wait for fresh corn from our garden, but you see, the wait is what's killing the fun for him. But it's clear, if we want the reward, if we want the fresh fruit of the harvest, we have to be willing to put in the time and do the work in order that we might finally taste the harvest. So Jesus' final point for today, for those people who struggle to wait for the harvest to be grown is that there is already a harvest which is ripe and ready to be brought in. The harvest is ripe. Ask God to equip you to reap for him. You know, so often pastors come to this passage in Matthew and they just leave it right there. They hope that people are going to connect the dots. So many times it seems to be enough to just simply say, hey, guess what? There's a harvest out there. It's ready. Go and get them. Bring them in. Here's the real heart of Jesus' point for today. We have got to be willing to go, teach, preach, heal, and bring compassion. We must be willing shepherds, willing, ready to work. We must always be at the ready to reap and collect the harvest for him. But this isn't just some simple thing that we do because the harvest is ready. Jesus identifies this ripe harvest. And that harvest is important because guess what's coming? His kingdom. And so it's as if Jesus says, listen, the kingdom of God is coming. I'm going to bring it. I'm coming back very soon for you. That harvest is ripe and ready. It's now or never. Get him in here. Bring him into the storehouse. Listen, Jesus might come tomorrow. He might come next Tuesday. He may come three years or 30 years from now. I don't know. It is not for us to know the time, the day, or the hour. But what we do no, without even so much 
is a shred of a doubt is that Jesus is coming and he is coming soon. Amen? And if that is true, Jesus wisely notes then that the harvest is about as ready as it's ever going to be. What are you waiting for? Get out there, teach them, preach them, and reach them. Can you remember that? Teach them, preach them, and reach them before it's too late. What happens when we ignore that ripened fruit on, fruit on the tree? Well, if you ignore that ripe apple or peach on the tree, eventually what's going to happen is it's going to fall to the ground. And the worms are going to slither in and they're going to eat it up. Folks, the great day of Jesus is coming. The harvest is ready. Jesus promised us that. The only question left for us is this. When it really matters, when it really counts, when it really comes to Jesus and his kingdom being fulfilled, those who come behind us, will they have found us to be faithful enough that we brought them with us into the storehouse? Will we have been faithful enough to lead people to Jesus? Will it be because each of us was willing to go and teach and preach and heal and bring compassion? Or the opposite, will the harvest just go to waste? Listen, it's up to us. It's up to you. It's up to me. There is a plentiful harvest, but what about the workers? Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead us to believe. And the lives we live inspire them to obey. May we be the workers that Jesus calls for. May the harvest finally come home to God's storehouse as we faithfully serve him each and every day. I said just a moment ago, it's a little light in here this morning. Some of you probably said, yeah, what are we going to do about that? Here it is, folks. The harvest awaits. We got to be willing to teach, preach, and reach, right? Amen? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that your kingdom is coming. We thank you that Jesus has promised he is coming and he is coming soon. We thank you that in that promise of his return is rescue for us. Father, will you give us the same burden for the people we meet on the street? For the people we sit next to at work? For the neighbor two doors down who drives us crazy? For our children who have walked away? For our families? For all those who don't know Jesus. You know, Father, the truth is sometimes we look out into the world and we go, that's a ripe harvest? Really? You know the harvest, Father. You know it is ready. Will you burden our hearts then to go with eyes that see the harvest as you see it, ready to teach about you, to reach out with your love, and to bring the harvest home. Father, will you help us to teach and preach and reach? And Father, may all those who come behind us find us faithful. We pray this in Jesus' name.
journey of the narrow road. And those who've gone before us, mine, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary, their lives a stirring testament to God's sustaining grace. and sisters, that's our prayer for each and every one of you this morning, for all of us, that as we walk this narrow road as pilgrims on a journey, as all of those years go by and we think about all the things that have happened in our lives and the people we've met, may they find us to have been faithful. May they find the fire of our devotion for God so inviting so addicting that they say, I want some of that. And may we be just a tiny little piece of the story of bringing God's harvest home. So as you go out into this world, searching for harvest, would you go with the love of God our Father, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Thank you for joining us this week. Have a wonderful week.